Hello, I'm Deepak Bhatt reporting from ESC Congress 2018 in Munich. I am here with my good friend, Professor Gabriel Steg, and we've got more trials for you and some non-trial stuff as well. Really lots of good stuff here at ESC this year. Let's start off with the Global Leaders Trial, a much anticipated trial. You were involved with the trial. Yes. I wrote the editorial, it's in The Lancet. What, you want to give the audience a recap of what the study was and what it showed? So Global Leaders is a large investigator-initiated trial in 16,000 patients undergoing PCI, whether it's AC, PCI for ACS or elective PCI. And the, all patients uh, receive a drug-eluting stand, and then they were randomly assigned to either a conservative or conventional strategy of anti antiplatelet therapy which, with aspirin and clopidogrel for a year if they underwent elective PCI, or aspirin and anticoagulant for a year if they underwent PCI for ACS. And beyond the year, they received aspirin monotherapy for another year. The experimental arm was only one month of aspirin and then 24 months of ticagalor, which, mean, which means that there were 23 months when it was monotherapy with ticagalor. So it's really testing long-term monotherapy with ticagalor compared to the conventional DAP for a year followed with aspirin. So it's a bit of a complex design. Okay. I also want to point out that it's an open-label trial. The primary outcome was an ambitious primary outcome of all-cause mortality and Q-wave myocardial infarction. So it's a very restrictive outcome, much more restrictive than what is commonly used in CBDES and MI, where often we pick up what people feel are modest troponin rises that right. may not have clinical implications. Here we're talking about mortality and large Q-wave myocardial infarctions. The primary outcome after a year showed a modest but significant reduction in favor of ticagalor monotherapy. But after two years, at the end of the trial, 24 months, the p-value was 0.07. So it just missed a significant reduction with ticagalor monotherapy, although there was no harm and major bleeding was not increased in the ticagalor monotherapy compared to the conventional strategy. So I think overall, uh, it's, it's really just missing. <laughs> we just missed uh, the, the outcome. We have to note that there was substantial crossover in an open-label trial, as one unfortunately knows happens, uh, particularly in the Ticagalo monotherapy arm. Many patients crossed over to aspirin monotherapy, either because they were not adherent to the protocol, but also because they might have had side effects, bleeding or dyspnea related to Ticagalo. The end result is that by intention to treat, the trial is neutral. Didn't reach the primary outcome at 24 months. Yeah, so, you know, I think it falls in that category of close but no cigar. I mean, there are a lot of intriguing signals there, probably are true, but again, in an open label, non-inferiority trial, I think the current standard of care remains the current standard of care. I think I titled the editorial aspirin remains the global leader in secondary prevention. And I think, you know, the idea of ticlagrel or monotherapy is interesting, but it's more expensive. You know, patients were less adherent with it twice a day, some dyspnea. So, you know, I, I think for secondary prevention, aspirin remains standard. And for that early period, DAPT remains the standard of care. Well, speaking of antithrombotics, what about commander heart failure? That was an interesting trial looking at rivaroxaban versus placebo in patients with heart failure. There was some thinking, I, I never really bought into it, that you know, with heart failure there's all this thrombin generation and maybe using a NOAC in that setting would reduce important thrombotic events. But the trial overall didn't meet its primary endpoint. And uh, what do you think? Yeah, so it's really interesting because as you point out, there were two reasons behind the trial. The first one is we always suspected and we know that there are a number of patients with heart failure that develop thrombotic complications. So giving an antithrombotic agent might be of benefit overall because you prevent venous thromboembolism, arterial thromboembolism, AFib-related thromboembolism, and so on and so forth. And the second aspect was the concept that maybe thrombin signaling might be important in heart failure independently of thrombosis. Well, in that population of patients who, with CAD who were recently admitted for heart failure in the hospital and, and just discharged with heart failure and elevated natriuretic peptides, first of all, they died mostly of heart failure, right. and there was no signal of efficacy of that strategy. So I think clearly uh, that rules out this indication. Of course, this is a very specific indication, but in that space, I don't think anticoagulation in general, even with the NOACs, has a rule. Yeah, I think it's an important message. If you're in sinus rhythm, 
uh, don't have some other indication for an anticoagulant. Just because you have heart failure, that's not a reason to put someone on anticoagulant. So uh, an important message, I, I think. Well, let's uh, stick with the theme of thrombosis. There was also a presentation here uh, by uh, Dr. Narula, uh, and it was a paper as well in Jack by Dr. Narula and Dr. Narula. Uh, I was a co-author on it that looked at patients, uh, specimens, uh, amputations, and looked at the arteries and found uh, in patients with peripheral amputation a lot of thrombus there, uh, suggesting that acute limb ischemia or you know sort of uh, critical limb ischemia that uh, thrombus plays a very big role. And some of that thrombus, it's hard to say, could be uh, embolic from plaque upstream of the site of amputation. Could even be thromboembolic. It was hard to tell in amputation specimens whether the patients had AFib. But regardless shows the potential importance of antithrombotic therapy in PAD, provides some mechanistic insights. What do you think? Well, I think this is totally consistent with data we've seen from clinical trials of antithrombotics in the field where We've seen recently from trials of antiplatelet agents, uh, TRA2P uh, and, and, and Pegasus, yeah. that uh, intensive antiplatelet therapy has some efficacy in preventing events in patients with PAD. We've seen in COMPASS that combining antiplatelet therapy with low-dose anticoagulation has a major benefit in this population. So we, now this is consistent with the, these observations, so this is the background to support this, entirely consistent with the uh, trial findings. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think it is insightful in terms of providing a pathological basis why antithrombotic therapy could have real benefits in PAD. Let's move on now to something uh, quite uh, different, amyloid, uh, which uh, we were chatting before the actual taping. There's a lot of it out there once you start looking for it. Um, and a uh, new drug that was quite beneficial in patients with trans amyloid, a specific subtype of, of amyloid, and in fact, lower mortality and lower cardiovascular hospitalization. I mean, it looked pretty good to me. What did you think? I think that I'm enthusiastic about this. At last, we have treatments that work in amyloid. Granted, only for this, so far, demonstrated for this form of amyloid, TTR amyloid. This is the second positive trial. We've had another molecule, patiziran, that also reported earlier this year positive results. So we now have several treatments that work and we can offer to these patients. And I think as a clinician, the takeaway is we have to look for these patients because now we can offer them something. We used to think it doesn't matter anyway because it's bad prognosis and we can't have a specific treatment. Well, now we have a treatment, so we have to look for TTR amyloid. Yeah, no, really an important study, I believe. And uh, finally, we should probably mention the MITRA-FR study. This examined patients with functional mitral regurgitation. Important to make that uh, distinction, uh, what type of mitral regurgitation is, where uh, using a percutaneous approach to reduce mitral regurgitation didn't provide any significant benefits. So, uh, a negative study in that respect. Uh, there is another study coming, probably a TCT, so another at bat here, the COAP trial. But at least for right now, it looks like uh, clipping these mitral valves doesn't really do much. Yeah, I'll just highlight one important caveat. This is secondary mitral regurgitation. So we have a trial that shows no benefit of uh, clipping those mitral regurgitation when there's secondary mitral regurgitation. It's very different from primary mitral regurgitation, a totally different animal. But in secondary functional mitral regurgitation, we saw no benefit in mitral IFR. Yeah, and it might be because, you know, they've got a big blown out LV and there's just other bad stuff that they've got that's causing the MR. It's the consequence rather than the cause of the disease, probably. Yeah, but a bit disappointing because it, yes. at least you could have created a rationale why fixing it should help LV geometry remodeling and that sort of thing. So I guess I'd have to say a little disappointing in that regard, but that's why we do trials and don't just do stuff without testing them. Good, anything else that you thought was really important today? Well, there was a lot uh, at this meeting. I mean, there's, uh, there's so much to discuss. Uh, we presented a risk score for secondary prevention oh, right, from yeah. the Clarify registry uh, that, that we mentioned a couple of days ago. Uh, and um, uh, that's an interesting score to risk stratify patients with stable coronary artery disease. Uh, uh, it's simple and based on clinically available right. uh, parameters as opposed to biomarkers that are not necessarily available. I think it's generally highlighting to the need to stratify patients with stable coronary artery disease because it's a whole spectrum of risk. And I think in the future, with the novel, sometimes expensive or sometimes therapies that have side effects, it's going to be important to risk stratify these patients. Yeah, we've got to figure out who to target these novel expensive therapies to. There seem to be more and more coming up uh, every meeting. Well, it, 
hopefully provides all of you at home some sense of the excitement that we share here reviewing these different trials and registry results. Hopefully those of you back home holding down the fort are getting to enjoy Munich and ESC from a distance. Thanks so much for joining and thanks to Professor Steg Thank for providing his insights. Thank you.